our studies tonight in the book of Acts. We begin to move into the persecution of the church as we uh, see some very significant things taking place and setting an example for us so that we might know also what to expect when the testimony of you as an individual or the testimony of this church as a church begins to be a little too hot for the world around us. We're in Acts chapter 6. Last week we looked at the proper division of labor and its results in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that once again you give to us the opportunity of studying it freely, studying it openly and without fear of persecution. And yet, Father, we know that as the latter days approach, we will, perhaps even in this very place, experience persecution for the proclamation of the Word of God. And so, Father, we pray that while we have the opportunity, we might learn from the Word of God so that we will be prepared and ready to respond in the way that is not only most appropriate, but the way in which our Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified, other believers will be edified, and a testimony will be brought to the unsaved world. We thank you, Father, now for this time and pray that you will bless us as we look into the scriptures again and as your Holy Spirit applies them to our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we saw that as we moved into Acts chapter 6, the problem that the church was having was someone was being neglected. And we noted last week that when we as Christians are not functioning effectively, the cause is usually one of seven things. Either we're not aware of the problem, we don't care about the problem, we have limited resources to resolve the problem, we have disorganized time and fail to address the problem, we're experiencing good growth and are over overtaken with the logistics of the problem, or we're experiencing bad growth, which is draining time and resources, or we do have organized time, but we've already allocated it to more urgent or important matters. And uh, time management is a problem for many people. I often face it, I suppose you do on occasion. And uh, as we look through the New Testament, we find there were time management problems then. But they solved the problems in different ways than the world solves the problems. They had the infinite resource of the power of the Spirit of God. They also knew when they were walking in the will of God and out of the will of God. And if we can learn to get the eternal perspective, we'll discover that God always has time for us to do the things that are important for us to get done. We are his servants. We have been given assignments to do. 
We have responsibilities and obligations, not merely to those around us, but to the Lord of heaven. And when we are doing things the way that God wants them to be done, he guarantees that the time will be available to accomplish what he wants accomplished. Too often we fill our time with things that do not count for eternity, with things that are not important from the heavenly perspective, with things that maybe make us feel good or things that enable us to get out of other work that we really should be doing, and so we're simply doing busy work. But as we look at our Lord Jesus Christ, as we look at his ministry through the Gospels, one of the things that stands out for us is he was never in a hurry. And yet, he fulfilled the scripture quoted in Hebrews, Lo, I come to do thy will. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. And we find that when he reached the point of death on the cross, he could say, it is finished. Everything that the Father had given him to do, he had done. Every prophecy that needed to be fulfilled, he had fulfilled. Every leper that needed to be cleansed, he had cleansed. Every demon-possessed person that he was supposed to cast out the demons, he had done so. He accomplished everything that the Father had willed for him to do. As you and I go through life, day by day we have to make choices as to how we will use that limited resource that God has given to us, which is time. The day of our death is appointed. We don't know when it'll be. It might be younger. It might be at an older age. It could be suddenly. It could be a lingering death. The question is, will we be ashamed when we stand before Jesus Christ because we have disobeyed and failed to do what he has called us to do? God will not be thwarted in his plan. He will accomplish his will, but we will not receive the blessing for having been the instrument of that accomplishment and so we saw that solutions to spiritual problems always require two things. Number one, divine wisdom. And we're going to talk somewhat about that tonight because we find it clearly uh, one of the key characteristics of Stephen that got him into so much trouble with the world. Number one, divine wisdom. And number two, a recognition that Satan may use a problem to sidetrack a more beneficial ministry to the entire body. Oftentimes we get sidetracked into things that look like they're important, but they actually hinder, slow down, or bring to a halt other ministries that God would have us to be involved in, which will be more beneficial to the body of Christ and a greater testimony to the world. And unless we have divine wisdom, we will not be able to tell the difference between them. How important it is for us then to have that wisdom. We talked about different types of problems and the use and proper, proper use and abuse of the spiritual gifts. We won't go back over that, but we saw that chapter 6 here offers us some solutions to problems that we can apply almost in every case. Number one, setting biblical priorities. We talked a great deal about biblical priorities last week. Make sure that your priorities in life are biblical or in the order that God says they should fall. Unless you have articulated what the priority should be in your life, you will find yourself constantly spinning your wheels. They, they set their priorities here. And it was more important to proclaim the word of God than even to take care of widows. <coughs> we find the second thing was not taking personal offense when a problem that we think we have becomes lower on the agenda of someone else who has set biblical priorities. The third thing is there had to be full disclosure to all the people who were involved in the problem, either as the problem itself or as a solution to the problem. Don't try to solve everything all by yourself without bringing into the loop those within the body of Christ who can be part of the solutions to the problems. And we gave you some illustrations of that last week, and I praise God that some people have responded already uh, to the few simple suggestions that we made last week on that issue. There was full disclosure, there's delegation, there's identification of the solutions, there's a determination of how much, there's a qualification as to who will provide the solution, 
there must be a chain of command or authority structure and there must be official recognition of that authority structure so that everyone knows how they fit into it. And when the church functions properly, we can expect the results that they had. An increase in the functional output of the Word of God, numerical church growth, church growth in the location of the outreach, and the salvation of some who have already had divinely ordained preparation prior to their conversion. And so tonight we move into apologetics, power, and persecution. In verses 8 through 10 it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, <coughs> excuse me, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and them of them of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now you recall, as we've looked earlier in Acts chapter 6, that Stephen was one of the first deacons chosen. He's listed in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. <coughs> in fact, he's the very first one on that list. And he's on that list, number one, for a particular reason. Because as you look at the list of the seven deacons who are chosen there, he is the only deacon who is given a description concerning his character in that verse. It says that Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He's also a man who clearly stands out among the first deacons. He's a man who knows the Word of God. We find that from our passage tonight. He's a man who has applied himself diligently to study the scriptures and know how they relate to real life. He's a man who has studied all the passages of scripture that relate to the promised Messiah. We see him debating here with Jews who come from five different locations. And none of them are able to prove that he is wrong about Jesus being the Messiah because he is using the Hebrew scriptures to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ. We'll see more of that as we get into Acts chapter 7 where he stands before the Sanhedrin and where he gives his full testimony and explains the history of Israel and how it fits in with the very present rejection that they have of Jesus the Christ. Man, Stephen is a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And we find those are the two things that are mentioned here in this passage tonight. The second thing we notice, as you will see this throughout all of Scripture, is that Satan always shoots for the top man. Satan knows that if he can nail somebody who is a key man, there will be others who will disperse and flee away. Stephen is clearly the most powerful of the deacons in terms of his spiritual life. He's the one who is out there confronting those who do not believe. And he's confronting them on their own turf. He's confronting them in the synagogue. It's rather interesting that here's a man who is not either ashamed of the gospel or afraid of the consequences of preaching the gospel. Too many of us are afraid of the consequences, what might happen to us if we stand boldly for the faith in a public context. Because we look at passages like this. We look at other places where the apostles are being persecuted in the book of Acts. Up to this point, we've seen the apostles persecuted themselves, but they get out of it. And so now the attack comes at the second level. It comes at that level of these newly appointed deacons. And they have not been appointed deacons long. Attack often comes shortly after a man gains his position by those who want to see if they can rock him off of his foundations. I've discovered that, and not just through personal experience, but through uh, talking with other pastors, they come to a new pulpit and they immediately are faced with very dis dissident people in the church. Those who have this agenda, those who have this agenda, those who have that agenda, who come and before they can get themselves well established in that place, begin to 
push for specific things that are contrary to the scripture. I've experienced it everywhere I've gone. I think that every pastor I've spoken to about that subject has also concurred that when you move into a new ministry, you will find that Satan attacks, and he will attack very powerfully to see if he can knock you off your moorings. That's happening to Stephen here. He's a new deacon, but he is a man full of wisdom, and he is full of the Holy Ghost. Very difficult to knock a man like that off his foundation. Thus, when you appoint deacons in a church, you need to make sure that they are solidly grounded in the Word of God, that they are filled with the Spirit of God, that they are walking by faith, that they have their eyes focused on Christ, not on pleasing people around them. Even within this last week, I've had a serious attack by someone uh, who called me on the phone and raked me over the coals in their own way for not preaching what they wanted to hear. And uh, I had to respond to them with kindness, but also tell them, look, you're my brother, but I preach the word of God as I understand the word of God, and that's the way you'll hear it here, and you knew that four years ago when I came, and you know it's the same now. You'll find that there will be attacks over and over again. Now, in Stephen's case, it goes farther than the kind of verbal abuse that sometimes church leaders experience in this country, but in other countries, some of them have given their lives because they would not flinch in the testimony of Christ. That's what we see happening here with Stephen tonight as we look at it. Third, because of his two qualifications, that is being full of faith and full of the Spirit, and he was still in the apostolic age, he was able to perform sign gift miracles, and we studied those in a great deal of detail on Wednesday evenings uh, three years ago, so I won't go over that again. But we find that he is making an impact. If you're not making an impact, you usually don't get too much pressure because Satan is organizing his demons and sending them out there to motivate people in other places where there is someone who is making an impact. The servants of Christ who make the greatest impact are always going to come under the greatest fire. Something else that's very interesting here is Stephen is all by himself, but we find that there's a large group of unbelievers who have gathered together against him. Unbelievers tend to gang up on effective Christians. Sometimes you find this in the workplace where you've had a Christian testimony, perhaps you've been witnessing one-on-one -on -one to somebody. It begins to spread through the office that, uh, you know, here's so-and-so who's a Christian, and suddenly when you're sitting and quietly talking to this person at some time, four or five people come into your cubicle and begin to harangue you and try to divert the testimony that you have. I've had that happen on multiple occasions where I was sitting and quietly talking with someone and others overhearing the conversation will simply uh, join the conversation, though they were not invited to do so, and begin to sidetrack things, try to get the person who is under conviction of the Spirit of God to think about something else or not to pay attention or to mock what's being said. I've seen it over and over again. Here we have five different groups ganging up on Stephen. Sort of like the Arab nations, which if it were not for Israel, they would be fighting among themselves as they frequently have done in the past. But now they have a common enemy, and so they gang up on the Jews. Now, r rather interesting, the groups that are mentioned here. The first one are called libertines. Uh, it's not because they had licentious doctrine. No, they were very, very strict Jews. Uh, these libertines, it's a term that was used of those who had been slaves, Jewish slaves, who had been sold to various parts of the Roman Empire and then had been set free. And uh, the reason for that setting free was not because uh, their masters were so uh, generous or magnanimous. What well, in uh, 20 AD, uh, we find that the emperor then, Tiberius, expelled all the Jews from Rome. It's mentioned in the book of Acts a little bit later on. And these free Jews made their way back to Jerusalem. They had lived in close proximity to the pagan gods, and they had set their hearts on Pharisaic Judaism. They were really hard-nosed Jews because they had been in the context where they were desperately holding on to their faith as slaves in this pagan Roman world. And as a result, they look at Stephen 
as someone who is defecting from the faith. That's the reason for his speech in Acts chapter 8, where he tracks the history of Israel. It's rather interesting also to see that Cilicia is mentioned. The capital of Cilicia, which was one of the Roman provinces, it's a province in Asia Minor, the capital city was Tarsus. That was the home of Saul, who later became Paul. And we know from later discussions by the Apostle Paul that Paul was present during these debates <coughs> with Stephen. In fact, he mentions the fact that he was there at the stoning of Stephen and he held the cloaks of those who were throwing the stones. So we're put on notice all the way back here in Acts chapter 6 that there are those from Cilicia who could not refute Stephen. Saul was there. Saul brought up under the feet of Gamaliel. Saul, a brilliant scholar in the law of Moses. But when he came face to face with Stephen, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, he had no answers. And folks, when you face somebody who does not have answers, only one of two things can happen. Either they will be convicted of their sins and brought to repentance and faith in Christ, or they will harden their hearts and they will turn against you and will oppose you and, if they can, destroy you. Okay, the way in which they destroy us today isn't quite as serious, perhaps, as we see here in Acts chapter 6, but they will try to destroy you somehow. They do not like being put down where they have no answers. And we find that Saul was among the group that was here. You know, it's interesting that though the Jews were from different parts of the empire, they held a common hatred for the early church because the first deacons were such effective evangelists, particularly Stephen. Oh, that God would raise up some deacons in the church here like that. Who are powerful in their faith, who are knowledgeable in the word of God, who are effective in their outreach to those around them. And how we pray for such men to be a part of this assembly here. You know, we've mentioned this before, but I don't want you to forget it. As with the creation-evolution debate today, the evolutionists have stopped debating creationists because the creationists always tend to win the debates. You know, back when Dr. Morris and Dr. Gish were first getting the Institute for Creation Research started, and I remember back in the, the early 60s, middle 60s, when all of the debates were going on. And there were literally debates against with creationists versus evolutionists all over the United States. The evolutionists thought, this is a piece of cake. We can win these debates easily. We won't have to worry about it. We'll go up there and we'll just blow them away with all the scientific evidence. And in almost every case and venue, the creationists won the debate hands down because the evolutionists did not have answers for the things that the creationists had discovered. And I personally heard many of those debates. I used to take our young people up at Mountain View Gospel Church to those debates back in the 70s. And you know, the creationists always won. So a call went out among the evolutionists, stop debating the creationists. And so they changed their approach. Here's Stephen debating. They can't win the debate. So what do they do? They kill him. And what's happening today, they don't debate the creationists anymore because that gives public exposure to the creationist position and demonstrates the weakness of the evolutionary position. Instead, they have new tactics. They fire creationist faculty. If a faculty member, even who is not a creationist, questions something about the dogma of evolution, he gets fired. He gets laid off for some paltry reason. They also do other things. They refuse to publish creationists. They don't allow their arguments to be heard in public. They mock creationist students. They refuse to let creationists into higher educational degree programs. If they're in the degree program, some reason is found for dropping them out of the degree program. No, they don't 
stone you to death now, though someday they might, but they will not tolerate the truth, for they have no answer for it. The next thing that we notice here is those who are the most effective were targeted first, but the rest of the believers experienced the backlash. After Stephen is stoned in Acts chapter 7, we find a backlash coming that affects the entire church. Folks, this is why you need to pray for people in authority over you. This is why you need to pray for those who are faithfully and clearly and publicly taking a stand for the truth of the gospel of Christ. Because you see, if they are defeated in battle, if you will, there will be a tremendous influx, a flood that comes in and affects you who have sat silently by. That happens here after Stephen gets stoned to death. The next thing that we notice as we look at this is the power in this verse is the miraculous power of the apostolic age for the purpose of performing sign gifts given by the Holy Spirit of both healings and miracles. We're squarely in the apostolic age here. This is the period in which the New Testament canon is being completed. It is not yet finished. And so God is giving new revelation. God is communicating his word through men and giving them these sign gifts to support the truth of what they are proclaiming. We have the finished revelation of scripture now. And that's the reason why Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 13 that these sign gifts have passed away. They've been turned off by the Spirit of God because we now have what is the most powerful thing of all, which is the completed Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not merely something that does a miracle to the external body, but something that actually penetrates all the way to the heart. That's the Word of God. The Word of God is quick. It's living. It is powerful. Here is Stephen, full of power, but there is something more powerful than the miracles and the healings that he is performing, and it is the Word of God. And that's what they can't stand. Healings are making people well. Miracles are signs given as proof of the truth of the word and sometimes striking someone in judgment. They don't heal them. They, For example, Elymas the sorcerer uh, in Acts chapter 13 is struck blind. That's a miracle. It didn't exactly heal him. The next thing we notice is that these who stood against him, even though they were large in number, they were not able to resist. The picture of resisting here, it's, it's the word anhistemi, which is to stand against. The, they weren't able to stand against the word that Stephen was proclaiming. Think about standing in front of the tsunami that came rushing in to the coast of Japan. How long could you stand against the tsunami. Absolutely impossible. Utterly impossible. That is the power with which Stephen spoke. The power of the Spirit of God absolutely overwhelmed all of those who stood against him. They could not resist the power with which he spoke. You know, I suspect that perhaps through Stephen's mind at that point was going the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ found in Luke chapter 12, excuse me, 21 and verse 15. Jesus says, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Same word. That's what's happening here with Stephen. In Acts chapter 6, the entire context of our Lord speaking is starting in verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, as before these end times events which he has prophesied. They will do these things to you. They will persecute you. They will deliver you up into the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. This gives you a public forum in front of of the very worst opposition 
so that when they stand before Jesus Christ, they will have no excuse. You know, folks, that is a, that's a powerful thought. That the reason God puts us in the context of persecution where we must give a defense for our faith is so that those who hate the gospel worst will hear the gospel clearest and will thus be most accountable when they stand before Christ in judgment. Our Lord goes on. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, here's the verse, which all of your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death doesn't say all, and I suppose that most of us are thankful for that. But it says some of you they shall put to death. We see the first martyr of the church in Acts chapter 6. It's Stephen. He's coming on the scene. He's moving toward his trial, which will end in his execution. Some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Not hated because you are ugly, not hated because you are smart, not hated because you are stupid, but hated for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Now doesn't that seem odd for our Lord to say that in verse 18, when he just said that some of you will be caused to be put to death? What he's telling them is, even if that happens, it's not a bad thing. Not a hair of your head shall perish. You'll be in the center of my will, doing what I will, and receiving the greatest reward possible as you give your life for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In your patience possess ye your souls. That's what explains that verse about not a hair of your head shall perish. And then it says they should, would not be able to resist the wisdom by which he spoke. You know, wisdom, you've heard me talk about that on multiple occasions. That's, that's a major theme in Scripture, in case you hadn't got it. Uh, <clears throat> the, there are several books, of course, we know, that are considered biblical wisdom literature, such as the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, the book of James, and so on. That's what's called wisdom literature. And the more you meditate upon those books, the greater wisdom you will understand concerning God and his purposes. But let me read you just a few verses about wisdom. It says that Stephen was full of wisdom. It tells you what books of the Old Testament, because the New Testament had not yet been written, it tells you which books of the Old Testament he had been studying. In Proverbs 4, 7 it says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Now, if we were talking about all the things in the world that there are, do you know what the principal thing is? It's not money. It's not position. It's not power. It's not wealth. It's not a big family. It's not a little family. It's not lots of friends. It's not an office in the church. The principal thing is wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, 7. One of the key prayers that I have prayed for about 50 years, maybe a little longer than that, is the prayer for wisdom. I pray that every day. I pray that every time I get into a tight situation, but I understand also from the Word of God that the only way you get wisdom is studying the Word of God. God does not work in a vacuum. God does not send wisdom as a bolt of blue out of the sky when you have no content to work with. You pray for wisdom and then God gives you understanding of the specific portions of Scripture which apply to your current need. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to put the facts to work. Biblical knowledge is the accumulation of biblical facts. 
Biblical wisdom is the ability to take biblical facts and apply them to your current need. Dear people, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Stephen had done it. And you know what goes parallel with that? Right alongside it, he was full of wisdom. He was also filled with the Spirit. He was full of the Holy Ghost. You see, as you begin to get to know the Word of God, as you begin to see how it applies to life, as you begin to allow your life to be controlled by the Spirit of God, which is biblical wisdom, you will discover that you have an impact for Christ. Stephen had both of those things. James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and it breedeth not, and it shall be given him. How I love James chapter 1. But he says, let him ask in faith. Oh, you cannot doubt when you ask for wisdom. It's a promise of God. You must believe the promise of God when you ask for the promise of God. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. That water is so fluid, it goes every which way. Sometimes it's beneficial, sometimes it's damaging. Sometimes it pulls things off the bottom, sometimes it sinks things to the bottom. You don't want to be like a wave of the sea. Unpredictable, fluid, unable to be counted upon one way or the other. A man who has no wisdom is like a wave of the sea. Sometimes he's beneficial, sometimes he's damaging. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Ask in faith, otherwise you'll waver and toss like a wave. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. If you don't get wisdom first, you're not going to get anything else. We all want to pray for money. We all want to pray for good health. We all want to pray for a peaceable family situations. We all want to pray for all these things around us in the world. The first prayer request that we need to make is the prayer for wisdom, and it must be in faith. Here is a man who had clearly prayed that kind of prayer and had sought the wisdom of God in the Word of God so that when he was attacked on the issues which he was proclaiming as truth, he was able to answer from the Word of God and no man could resist the power of the Holy Spirit in him as he spoke. Does that describe us? Does that describe our spiritual walk? Does that describe our testimony before the watching world that looks at us every day? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You'll never be able to count on him, never know what you're going to get as a response, never see any consistency of life. You'll see a floating wave back and forth. The second thing that we learn about wisdom is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now let me just tell you a little fact here. This is one of those factoids that gets thrown into sermons every now and then, but it, it helps us understand what God thinks about wisdom, how important it is. Wisdom is mentioned 234 times in the Bible in 222 verses. That's longer than some of the books of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. 222 verses which some of them have more than one reference to wisdom in it. And I'm only talking about wisdom. I'm not talking about understanding. I'm not talking about knowledge. Although those would expand it extensively because both of those deal with knowing God and understanding His Word just as wisdom does. 222 verses. Do you know what biblical wisdom is? Have you taken the time to study those verses, each one, independently? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do His commandments, His praise endureth forever, Psalm 111.10. God has that little phrase, by the way, three times in the Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We see it in Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There is no wisdom in the heart of someone who does not have the fear of the Lord. 
If you trace that phrase, and I did this many years ago as a freshman in college, I wanted to know what was the fear of the Lord. And so I tracked the fear of the Lord all the way through the book of Proverbs. And I came to the conclusion that the fear of the Lord is that point of salvation. When God suddenly becomes real to you and you begin to understand who He is, and that does not happen until you trust in Christ. That is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus Christ has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You have no wisdom if you do not have Christ. You may have great knowledge in the things of the world. You may be worldly wise, as worldly wise man is in Pilgrim's Progress. But you do not have true wisdom until you have the fear of the Lord. And that means that you do not have true wisdom until you have Christ as your Savior. For He is the one who is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ is the source of all wisdom and personified as such in Proverbs chapter 8. A magnificent, amazing chapter that reveals to us the pre-incarnate Son of God. There are also two things that Stephen had that were qualifications of deacons in verse 3. Because the deacons in verse 3 were supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. And that's what we see being expressed here. A deacon showing forth his qualifications. We look at him and we know that he knew God because he knew the Old Testament. You and I have much more. We have not only the Old Testament, but we have the New Testament as well. They had the Spirit of God coming upon them and then departing in the Old Testament. We have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit. How much wiser should believers, even the common, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, if you will, believers be than those of the Old Testament. We find something else. His wisdom and power would not have been known unless he had spoken. Let's pretend for a moment that this is possible. I don't think it's possible. But let's pretend for a moment that this is possible. Here is a man who is truly full of of wisdom. I mean, really, really knows the scriptures and how they are to apply to life. And this same man is truly filled with the Holy Spirit and walks by faith every day, which is the result of being filled with the Spirit. And yet he never says anything about Jesus to anybody. He comes to church but make sure he's not seen doing so, sits in the pew and rushes out. But never would anyone guess that he was filled with wisdom and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think that's possible, folks. If you are filled with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will transform your life, will metamorphosize you into one who is unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We believe and therefore we speak. It is absolutely necessary for a person who is filled with the Spirit of God and filled with wisdom not to speak. What a testimony Stephen had as we look here. His wisdom and power would not have been known unless he had spoken. Do you believe that you have wisdom from the Word of God? Do you believe that you are filled with the Spirit of God? Does it motivate you to speak on a regular daily basis? If not, then perhaps the spiritual life needs to be re-examined and we need to look into our own hearts and say, Father, where am I out of fellowship because I'm ashamed of the gospel of Christ? I'm afraid of testifying because of what might happen to me. Look, Jesus already told us what's going to happen to us if we are faithful in our witness. We just read the passage out of the gospel of Luke. We see the book of Acts and everything that happened to the apostles and the rest of the disciples through the book of Acts. We see what they did to our Lord Jesus Christ, who had a perfect, sinless life. He both did miracles of healing, which were truly beneficial. 
And he spoke incredible words that people hung on every word. And they killed him. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Now this is not to get you discouraged. This is to motivate you to trust in the living God, to study his word, to rely upon the spirit of God and his power so that you will focus on things eternal because this world and those in it are your enemies and the world is not your home. We're passing through. Our home is in heaven from whence we look for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our real citizenship is. We're American citizens, but first and foremost, we are citizens of heaven. In a Christian context, apologetics is the defense of the faith based on clearly stated truth, quote, unquote. You know, as we begin to be faithful and we express an apologetic, that isn't, we don't apologize, but we defend the faith by expressing verbally and in our life the truth, we will discover several things. Number one, a good apologetic will be when we speak with clarity, when we are articulate, when we have persuasive speech. But a good apologetic will always bring with it some kind of opposition and trouble. Apologetics is not debating of Christian scholars among themselves over how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Apologetics, which is what Stephen is doing here, is tackling the real issues of the real world with a clear statement of biblical truth demonstrated by experiential truth that the pagans already know to be true and that they've already admitted to be true. As Stephen is setting forth the scriptures to them, these are men who are Orthodox Jews who hold tightly to their Pharisaic faith and he is showing them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And they can't refute him and they see nothing in his life whereby they can accuse him. Earlier we've seen great revival. We've seen a great company of the priests believing but now Satan raises his army. He raises the opponents who will stand against this proclamation of the truth. He can't stand to see those who, whom he has had under his control suddenly moving over to the side of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he raises an opponent, a group of opponents, a great cluster of opponents who will try to destroy the one who is making an effective impact for Christ. If you live the way that Stephen lived, if you know the scriptures the way Stephen knew them, if you are filled with wisdom and with the Spirit of God, you will testify. You will testify. It's only when we are not filled with wisdom, it is only when we are allowing ourselves to have a leak in the system where we are not filled with the Spirit that we are ashamed or afraid to testify because of what somebody else might do to us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But the opposite we need to remember is also true. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord, that's faith. You're asking for wisdom in what faith? But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. What's your choice? You know, as you proclaim the truth, either people will repent and be saved or they will hate you and try to get rid of you. It's been that way all the way from the beginning. We go all the way back to Cain and Abel and we see that battle which men who do not want God will hate you and try to get rid of you. But we find that in the end, Abel is listed in the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And as you read through that list, you find that some of them had great successes. God blessed from our perspective in terms of the great successes that they had and great ministries and expansive outreaches and living long good lives. But others, 
Well, you get to that verse there in Hebrews chapter 11, and those people are also heroes of faith. They're stoned, they're sawn asunder, they're thrown to wild animals, they're living in caves, in dens, in rocks, in the mountains, they're hiding out. They are also heroes of faith. They are men and women who, like Stephen, studied the Word of God, believed the Word of God, absorbed the Word of God, wanted it to permeate every area of their life, were filled with the Spirit of God, and they communicated the Word of God, and they suffered for it because Satan raised up a banner against them, but their reward in heaven will last forever. Where do we stand tonight? You remember those verses it tells us about Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians. Very interesting, Alexandria, Egypt, where there's so much perversion of the original text of Scripture. And of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom of and the spirit by which he spake. Oh, that that might be true of us as well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you, Father, that you give us through your word and by your spirit wisdom. We thank you that you have promised to give wisdom to those who ask in faith, nothing wavering. Father, we pray tonight that you will give us wisdom. We pray tonight, Father, that by your Holy Spirit you will work in each of our hearts and lives and fill us with your Spirit, and not with the things of the world, not with the things of the flesh, certainly not with the things of Satan and his forces, but that you would fill us with the Spirit of God and cause our lives so to testify of Jesus Christ, so to speak and not to be ashamed, that others will come to know him as the Word of God is proclaimed and as you use it in their hearts to irresistibly draw them to our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.